On February 9th of 2004, 21-year-old UMass student Maura Murray drove from her dorm in Amherst, Massachusetts to the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At approximately 7.27 p.m., Maura spun out her 1996 Saturn on a hairpin turn on Route 112 in North Haverhill. There has never been a credible sighting of Maura since. Mora is five foot, seven inches tall. She weighs 120 pounds, and she has brown hair and hazel eyes. If you have any information regarding Mora's disappearance, please submit it to us, the Murray family at moramurrayfamilydirect at gmail.com or the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit. This is Missing Mora Murray. Welcome back to Missing Maura Murray. I'm Tim, here today being joined remotely by Lance. Lance, how are you? I am doing very well today. How are you, Tim? I'm doing really well, Lance. You know, this uh, this week for Crawl Space Media and for the nonprofit that we are on the board of, namely Private Investigations for the Missing, started by missing person Brianna Maitland's father, Bruce Maitland, this is a big week for Private Investigations for the Missing. Yeah, this is pretty big because this is the first time that Private Investigations for the Missing is working with two investigators on a case. These investigators are working pro bono. It's the first time that we can see Private Investigations for the Missing in action. That's right. And those two private investigators are well known to our audience, especially if you've listened to the Brianna Maitland series on both feeds, that being Crawl Space and Missing Maura Murray feeds. And the private investigators are Greg Overacker and Lou Barry. And as you said, they are doing this case pro bono as asked by Bruce Maitland to sort of publicize the nonprofit a bit more. And this is what they've come up with. And I got to say, it's pretty jaw dropping information. And the case they're working on is Erica Jane Franilich, and she's been missing since October 13th, 1986. She was 26 years old when she went missing. There was a number of reasons why they picked this case. One, the availability of people who were involved with the case, they were able to speak with these people persons of interest who they were able to speak with and uh, just the geographic location, the solvability. And and Bruce had reached out to them and said, use your best judgment on which case you want to start with. That's right. And so this is really the goal of private investigations for the missing. So this is why this service is so important and needs to be funded. And we want to remind you, there is a link to donate in the show notes. There is a GoFundMe, and there's also a website. It's investigationsforthemissing.org. Check it out. And there's also some social media pages. You can find those links in the show notes, too. And, you know, it would be great if all of this could be done for for no money. Uh, but when you need to look into a case as deeply as these two have looked into Erica's case, you have to pay for hotel rooms, you have to pay for food, you have to pay for travel, you have to pay for a number of uh, uh, miscellaneous expenses, and all of those expenses add up. And these two, uh, Lou and Greg, were generous enough to say, hey, we got it this time, and put together you know, kind of a list of what the costs end up for something like this. And then you'd have a good sense of what each private investigator would be up against uh, if they needed to come to the organization and request money if, if uh, the connection was made for other cases. So it's, it's a good starting point. It's a, it's a great case that they're starting on. That's an invaluable service to the family. And then we're going to have a really good template for future cases. Right. And for this to work, fully, we need everyone to share. You know, everyone listening out there right now, please, all we're asking for is a retweet or something like that and share with your friends. And uh, before we play the interview, also just want to let you know, there are a lot of names. Erica Jane Franilich is the missing woman. Richard is her husband. And Ricky Jr. or Ricky is their son. Obviously, all those names are spoken about a bit. I just wanted to uh, be clear about that right at the top, though. 
And the area in which we're talking about is a town called Middleburg, New York. And this is a town that is uh, close to Albany. It's a it's an hour or so from Albany. Uh, Schenectady. Poughkeepsie is, is within the range there. Uh, Cooperstown. Saratoga Springs. If anybody is listening in that area as well, make sure you spread the word amongst the people up there. Because after you hear this interview, you'll, you'll start to understand that the whereabouts of Erica probably didn't go very, very far past this uh, this general radius. Right, but I would also say that to our Brianna Maitland listeners in the area of Vermont to make sure you tell your neighbors and your friends too because this case has a connection to that same area of Vermont and perhaps even the Brianna Maitland case. I mean, Brianna's name is mentioned a little bit here in the interview. And this is just part one, Lance. Part two is going to be posted on both feeds tomorrow on Thursday, April 9th. And the reason is to make a maximum splash here. Yeah, you're totally accurate with that, Tim. The maximum splash is what we're going for. We have two, I would say, relatively popular true crime podcasts that have feeds that you can use in order to uh, disseminate information like this. So why not just take the opportunity, use those feeds to get as much information out there about a very solvable case. Erica Jane Franelich's case is very solvable. And again, she was 26 years old. She disappeared on October 13th, 1986, five foot, four inches, 100 pounds. She was wearing a baggy shirt and blue denim overalls. She's a Caucasian female, brown hair, brown eyes, and Erica's two upper front teeth protrude a little bit. She has a mole on her left knee. And anyone with information on Franelich's disappearance, please call 518-630-1700. Welcome back, Greg Overacker and Lou Barry. How's it going, gentlemen? Good. Uh, good. Good. Great. Well, how are you guys holding up in this environment? Are you um, are you sequestering yourselves in your respective homes, or are you still out and about doing uh, superhero work? I'm deep in the bunker. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much grounded myself. Okay, well, that's good news. Well, we are here today to discuss a missing person case that uh, you fellas are working pro bono for private investigations for the missing. Yeah, it's an interesting one, too. Is this the first case from uh, private investigations for the missing that that has been assigned to uh, licensed investigators? Yeah, uh, really, except for working on um, Brianna's case. I think this is the first one that the nonprofit has taken on that's awesome yeah great step this was asked uh bruce asked us to decide on one to work as the first case for the nonprofit you know because we don't consider brianna's for the nonprofit. so we were asked to pick choose one and because we're, we weren't getting paid we wanted to choose one that was kind of between the two of us which you know i'm here in new york and he's there in massachusetts And uh, how far apart are we, Lou? Like three hours? Yeah, probably two and a half, something like that. Yeah. So we tried to pick something that was kind of easy access for both of us. It didn't really work out that way too well. But uh, Lou had initially found one. Why don't you tell him about that one, Lou? Uh, Yeah, there was a local case that I was somewhat familiar with. um, And I actually sat down with the family members. And uh, it's definitely a solvable case. But... um, just for a variety of reasons, particularly some of the people that we were dealing with, it wasn't real practical for us to pick it up at this point in time, um, simply because Greg is, you know, two and a half hours away, and it's the type of case where you really needed multiple people at the same time working on it. So um, we met with them, discussed it with Bruce, and, and decided it probably wasn't a good case to take on right now. But in the meantime, Greg had found one. Um, up in his backyard that uh, really fit the bill. So go ahead, Greg. You can, uh... So the one that I found, I, I couldn't find a lot of information on the internet about it. And I, I tried, I mean, there's a few articles out there, and a couple of small interviews you can find. I hope you guys can put those in the links for people to read and uh, watch the, the video. But um, it's really strange. It's about, it's about 50 minutes from where I live. And 
It's down near, uh, it's in uh, Schoharie County, New York, which we used to go there. I remember going there on school trips. There's a tourist destination there called Howe Caverns, which is a really cool place if you ever get a chance to go there. But the area is littered with caverns. And the reason there's th this particular one is, uh, is a tourist destination as opposed to the others is a lot of them fill with water during the certain seasons. And this one doesn't, and it's really large. But when you, there's a main road that travels east to west here. And when you go from where I live down to where uh, this area is where this girl went missing, you cross over into Scarehary County, it's a whole different world. Um, the landscape changes dramatically. Uh, it's a little hard to explain, but there's, there's freshwater springs, there's everywhere, there's wells, there's caves, cave systems. It's really sparsely populated, extremely rural. But you travel a short distance and you drop down into Schenectady area, Albany area. It's a I work down there occasionally. It's a very strange area to, to all of a sudden pass into. You're on a main road and you turn down into this area and all of a sudden everything is hills. You know, really steep ravines and hills. And Cobleskill area, you probably heard of Cobleskill, which is, there's a college there and stuff. And is there a city, is this uh, close to uh, Albany? Is that the closest city? Uh, yeah. I can't tell you exactly the distance, but it's not all that far. Okay. I think it's about an hour, hour and a half, maybe. Not even. Yeah, not even. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an hour from Albany. It's not even. What's the primary occupation of someone who lives in this area? What, what type of, uh, you know, residents are, are there? Is it affluent? Is it more uh, working, working class? Well, the, the entire county has something like 45,000 people, and actually it's about 33,000 people. I just looked it up. It's, it's a really strange thing. It's extremely rural. The towns are really small. It's another one of those things where you drive around, much like where Brianna, uh, you know, everybody on your show I think knows us from Brianna's case, where you drive around and you think, where the hell do all these people work? You know, I don't, I don't want to put the area down because it really is beautiful geographically and all that other stuff, but, you know, it's... It's a certain way of living. There's not much there, you know what I mean? And everybody kind of knows everybody. So there's some small towns. Yeah, they're just real yeah. small towns. Beautiful, but not, I don't want to say remote either. But And you said Schoharie County? It sounded like Scary County. Yeah, Schoharie County, yep. So this town is Delinson, New York? I, yeah, I, that sounds like a small town. I had never heard of it. If you remember um, a few years ago, they had that horrible limousine accident where all those people were, were killed. That was in Scalari County. Yeah, that was, I don't know if you guys being from Massachusetts farther east of us, but it was uh, an entire family, and I can't tell you how many people it was, Lou. Was it like 10, 10 different family members in one limo, and they all died? Yeah. That happened in Schoharie. So Schoharie uh, itself is, is, is an extremely small town. In Middleburg, which is, is just a few miles south of there, which is where uh, she went missing, is another extremely small town. The population of Middleburg, New York, where where uh, Eric and went missing, is is about thirty five hundred people. So they're, they're small towns. Um, Delinson actually is near Schoharie. <clears throat> it's near both, but it's uh, not even a town. It's it's how do you, how would you how do you put that? It's it's all rural. It's like a, I think it's listed as a town, but it's it's there's nothing there. I mean, it's not like there's actually a, a town center or anything like that. Right. Okay. Well, uh, now that we've learned a little bit about the area that, uh, that this disappearance took place in, can you tell us a little bit about Erica Jane, and I believe her maiden name was uh, Poprafsky? Yeah. Erica was from Michigan. She's from Waterford, Michigan, large family. She met her husband. They were on a uh, crew that was doing construction, traveling around the country, right? They met out in Texas. Yeah. So er Erica was traveling with uh, her son, Christopher, and Christopher's father. He worked on a, on a crew that laid cable or installed cable. I'm sorry. These guys would be in groups. They would work in large groups of, of different guys from all different areas. She ended up meeting a man named Richard Franelich, 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 and she ended up being with him. Um, and they ended up getting married in Texas. They also had a child together named Ricky, well, Richard Jr. 
it's kind of a convoluted bit of a story, but Richard and Eric could travel around with this work crew, and they travel quite a bit, actually. Um, they end up in Michigan in 1986, where Erica's family is. She's a really large family. They stay with Erica's sister, Rhonda. I speak to Erica's sister, uh, Nada, N-A-D-A, quite often, and she describes her relationship as, as not good. I mean, uh, a lot of drug use, a lot of physical abuse. She basically stays at a few family members out in Michigan, and the family, they're a burden to the family because they're constantly fighting and in trouble. So Richard ends up taking off with Ricky. She has, she has her, her son, Christopher, and Ricky, and Richard. Richard ends up taking off with Ricky and goes back to New York. And leaves the son there. Why? Why did he take off? Why did he split up with her? Was this a permanent split? Yeah, they're 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 at odds. It's 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 a it's a in reality it's a brutal relationship, a really brutal relationship. A volatile relationship. Yeah, really volatile relationship. And at one so so Eric is trying to keep an eye on him there in Michigan because she doesn't want him taken off. He actually uh, puts both kids in the car to make her believe that he wouldn't leave with the other son. Uh, Christopher, who's not his, he drives about a half mile down the road and kicks uh, Christopher out of the car and uh, tells him to walk back home and takes off with his son, Ricky. And c- can you remind us how old each of those kids are? Jeez, I think that he was like six years old at the time, Ricky, or uh, Christopher was. Sorry, he instructed a six-year-old to walk home? Yeah. Eric and Richard are, are traveling around. They've got with them Christopher her son with Tommy, who who's, works on the crew but is now no longer in the picture, and they've got uh, Richard and, and her son Ricky, their son Ricky. They go back to Waterford, Michigan. Uh, they stay with Rhonda, her sister. They stay with Mike, her brother. Uh, you know, it's a volatile relationship. The family's not happy with them there. They don't have any money. They're kind of, you know, whatever. It's, a, it's not good. They're doing drugs and things like that. He, he, he's trying to get away from her. And she doesn't want him to. He end up, ends up saying he's going to go to the store. And he puts both kids in the car knowing that she, she doesn't think that he'll leave with her son. Christopher because it's not his child. So he drives up the road about a half mile. She lets him go to the store, obviously, because he got both kids. And he kicks Christopher out and tells him to walk home and takes off and goes to the ark. So, and yeah, Christopher's about six years old, somewhere around there. Once she realizes what's happened, she ends up sending... Christopher down to Arkansas to live with his grandparents, to stay with his grandparents, and she contacts Richard in New York and heads for New York. She wants to get her son back, and she wants to reconcile with Richard. She arrives in Delinson. She gets a friend to actually drive her there. As far as I can tell, it's probably a it's probably a ten hour drive. Um, her and Richard uh, take up again. Again, it's a volatile relationship. They're staying with Richard's family now. Um, the different family members, they're still doing drugs. It's an issue. At one point they end up living in their car. So it's the three of them, Richard, Erica, and Ricky, who's about two years old. It's just not good. The family members are, are not happy when they, when they do stay with them and stuff like that. There's talk of Erica stealing from the family members and things like that. We don't know if that's true or if that's something that they made up. They're in these little towns of Schoharie and, and Middleburg are, are nearby. They end up at a bar in Middleburg. Again, a population of about 3,500 people. And uh, it's October 13th, 1986. She steps out of the bar and gets on a payphone. And she calls her brother, Mike. And she tells Mike, she says, uh, she's in fear for her life. That her and Richard are having problems. They've been fighting in the she thinks he's going to kill her. They're seen fighting in the bar. They're seen fighting outside of the bar. There's witnesses to that. The phone call is verified. Uh, you know, her brother says this, but then they actually verified the phone call that was made from the bar, the payphone outside the bar. It's actually, I've been there. It was attached right outside the door. It was a 49 minute phone call to the brother. She said some odd things to, to the, her brother, Mike. She stated that, uh, he said, he said, well, you know, call the police. If this is this bad of an issue, you need to call the police. She said, I can't. He said, why? She said, well, cause they're in on it. He said, she said, there's a cop here with us. 
that I could never decipher. So you said there was a 49 minute phone call with Erica and her brother, Mike. Yeah. And he told her to go to the police and she said she couldn't. Yeah. She, she, from what he says, she told him that I can't go to the police. The police are here with us. There's, there's a cop here with us. Quick question. There was a cop here with us being here with us at the bar they were at. Yeah. She, she said that, 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 uh, you know, they were there with a group of people and that there was a cop in the bar that was with them. It, it's kind of a sad story, actually. Her, after she went missing, her mother got a brain tumor and ended up passing away after a while. But um, the father's passed away. She had a brother who just passed away who was really ill, who I liked a whole lot. I, I used to talk to him once in a while in the evenings. Um, and, and our brother, Mike, who took this phone call, um, has MS talking to Mike about this call now again it's been a lot of years and stuff like that my question to him was it was a 49 minute phone call you know she had to say more than I'm just I'm in fear for my life he said yeah he, she, he, she was pleading with me that he's going to kill me and um, he, he, she, she really had no way to go anywhere um, It's this isn't a town you could just walk from like where I live you, I can walk from my house to the thruway but there's nowhere to go. I mean, it's just a little town. So uh, the sheriff's department is quite a ways away in another, in Schoharie. Um, you know, it's eight miles up the road or something. But um, she had no money. She told him that. I have no money. I have nothing. And he said, well, if, if you call me tomorrow, I will get you a bus ticket. Just call me with the information. I'll charge it. Put on my charge card, whatever. It's the last they ever heard of her, heard from her. So, you know, again, uh, there's witnesses that they were fighting in the in the club and, and outside. The, the bar's no longer there. It's a coffee shop now. I went down with a, another investigator and, and uh, went to the different sites, and that was one that we went to. There's another bar right across the street that, that they frequented, too. And this is where the case uh, takes kind of a uh, unusual twist. As Greg said, no one heard from her again after that phone call, yet no one reported her as missing uh, until February of 87. And then it was reported to Michigan authorities by her family out there. So they contacted New York and New York said, well, she's not here. And that's where the case sat for what, seven years, I think, Greg? Yeah, there was some weird circumstances there. So Nada, her sister, reports her missing February, I think it's, I don't have it right in front of me, I think February 25th, 25th. Uh, 1987. Yeah. So there's that missing time frame there. And then they send it back to Waterford, Michigan. Michigan sends it back. What ends up happening is, uh, is um, uh, the state police end up st sending someone to do uh, uh, an initial and questioning. They, they, they basically had, a, I think, a, they just had a certain s set of circumstances they had to meet, like go down and question the family or something like this, go question her husband or whatever. So they did. They went and questioned a few people, went back and reported back to Michigan just to find out what, you know, what they, what they were saying was happened and it kept getting bounced. And, and then when someone did pick it up, well, then now that officer was now promoted. So it went to another officer, then he would go down and he would kind of do the same thing, maybe push it a little more and ask some more questions and interview some more people. And then he would get promoted and it would go to someone else. And they always kind of stayed in that limbo of the initial part of the investigation. And it literally went on like that until, 2003 I talked to a couple of investigators who picked it up and said well I didn't have it long and then I got promoted and I just gave it to the next guy and then he worked it for a little while and then he just gave it to the next guy and it just it it literally when I when I talked to Erica's sister about this I refer to Erica as the forgotten girl because it just got passed around and, it, and it, no one ever did the work that they should. until 2003. No one really worked it. Whoever whoever is responsible literally got a pass. And there was no family pushing it locally. The uh, family was all out in Michigan, and no yeah. one in New York seemed to have much uh, interest or concern over the fact that she was missing. So let me just get this straight here. She went missing, and we suspect foul play. And that was in October of 1986, October 13th. But she wasn't reported missing until February 25th, almost four months later. Right. Yeah, and even, yes. And even then, it was reported out to Michigan. 
uh, not to New York. So Michigan then contacted New York and, you know, New York uh, said, well, she's not here. <laughs> yeah. So they sent it back and then Waterford sent it back to here. And then they finally sent somebody up to ask some questions. And then it just kept getting bumped and bumped and bumped and bumped. And, you know, like Lou said, that like the family's out in Michigan, so there wasn't somebody here to poke and prod at the police. <laughs> and, you know, again, I don't hold that against the police. The police are, are the police. They have things to do. They, they, they're they busy, and they're under-staffed. But if, if you use Brianna's case, which a lot of your listeners are familiar with, if Bruce wasn't on the police all the time saying, I want updates, I want this, mm-hmm. are you guys working on this, are you working on that, they would have other stuff to work on. They have to go work on other things. You kind of have to be a bit of a thorn in their side, and they just couldn't do that. I mean, Erica's mother ended up having a brain tumor, and her sister that I speak to, I mean, the family was trying to take care of her, and there was just other issues going on, a big family, other illnesses. You know, the parents passed away. It was literally broke. The father died of a broken heart kind of thing. At one point, her two brothers showed up in New York and started – causing issues, I guess. So they were actually told um, to leave uh, or else they could face some charges themselves. They, they came down and, and uh, not with the police, but they but they ended up going to the, the Franelick family homestead. There's, it's like a farmhouse. There's no farm there, but it's, it's like a farmhouse on a property. And uh, we're giving people shit. And, um, <laughs> you know, the police, of course, are going to say, you can't do this, you know. But... They, they made the ride out here, and it had to be difficult for them. It's kind of like when we talk about us going to work on something and it's expenses and, you know, the traveling and the rooms and the food and everything. They had to come out here. It's like they, were, they were trying, you know what I mean? When you, when you talk to people about this that were in the know, they say, look, somebody was given a big pass on this. No one was ever put under the, under the lights, you know what I mean? She was missing for months, and no one even knew. No one even... You know, the family out in Michigan had things going on. And, and then it got to the point where, you know, Jesus, she's not calling us. We can't get a hold of her. And, you know, they kept trying, they kept trying. And uh, had to eventually go to the police. Was there any media coverage during this time? No. There's almost no coverage of this. Schenectady, which is where the, the newspaper comes out of for that area, over the years did some articles on it but i think that was kind of pushed by one particular investigator who handled the case from 2003 until he retired in 2012 he was the one guy the one guy that really went after it that really worked the case and he worked it hard he worked it real hard yeah and pretty amazing guy he he was the one i think that prompted that so there was there's a few articles that you can find newspaper articles and there's i think one interview that lou found TV interview, and they they asked her husband to come on and speak to answer questions, and he he won't do it. The investigator that you referenced who worked it hard, what year, what time frame was that, and how long did he work it? He picked it up in two thousand three, and he worked it until his retirement in two thousand. I think it was twelve. And are you referencing any of his work? I mean, you're you're obviously referencing some of his uh his files. Are you working directly with him, or is he providing any sort of uh advice or uh, consultation he gave us the basics but i mean he, he's a retired state trooper and he can't discuss the case so i mean he, he could take us and say look this is where this was this is where that is this is the time frame that this that and the other thing happened but no more than that yeah, basically he only told us what was already in the media yeah yeah but it was nice to hear from him because he could kind of walk yeah. you through and point things out. Well, yeah, he had some real good insight into things. But yeah, uh, you know, he's in a difficult position. Yeah, it was essentially uh, like starting from scratch. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it was a weird thing, and um, we ended up talking to. Uh, well, I have I have uh, the family hired private investigators out of Albany, so we have some of their work. I haven't spoken to them yet, but I do have some of their written work, some of their interviews, stuff like that. Is that stuff pretty helpful? Yeah. Yeah, it was very helpful. Well, some was. <laughs> yeah. Some of it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you, you can tell sometimes by reading reports what's going on, but, you know, there'd be a report where he, he did surveillance for four hours and, and so I didn't see anything. Well, 
Yeah, that's kind of common. It can be kind of common. But. What do you expect to see, you know, five years later? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so. they kind of soak in making a buck off of the family, which is sad. Yeah. But there, there are interviews there, and there's dates and times and things like that, and kind of where people yeah. were and who they were living with and stuff like that, which helps out a lot. But I don't want to jump ahead here too much, but one of the, one of the things we talked about um, when we were looking for a new case was we, we wanted to stay out of Vermont because we worked so much on Brianna's case up there, and we you know had a good relationship with the state and all that. Before you say anything, for the, for the listeners who know us from Brianna's case, this is this is an atomic bomb. That's this is the bomb that's you're gonna drop, because this this is the twist in this case that we had no idea was even gonna take place. That was even so. Maybe I should do it, tell a little bit more of the lead up before you tell them that. Sure, sure. So after the the phone call from the bar, uh, the forty nine minute phone call at eight fifteen p.m. on October thirteenth, nineteen eighty six, no one hears from Eric ever again. She's at the bar. She's arguing with her husband. She's outside the bar. There's an argument going on there. There's witnesses to that. So eventually she, uh, her husband is interviewed, you know, where's your wife? He says, well, a few days before Halloween, I took her down to Schenectady and I put her on a bus, a Greyhound bus to go back home. Uh, where did she get the money? He says, well, she had $280 on her, put her on the bus and she took off. That's the last I ever saw of her. Basically, that's his out is this is why I didn't report her missing because I thought she went back home. How do you guys find that story? Well, we know that it's not true. Um, we know that it's for an absolute fact it never happened. And I, I can't really go into that. But we know that it's no one believes it. They don't even believe it. But that's the story he still tells and his brother tells. And this is the story he's told the family and stuff like that, too. But they, they don't believe him either. But to this day, if you ask him, that's the story he'll tell. Well, I dropped her off at a few days before Halloween. I dropped her off the bus stop, and that's the last I ever saw of her. So they got a big family. Her, her, her husband's family is large. Uh, they live in this farm house, and there's uh, a couple other properties there that are associated with the farmhouse and the family or whatever. His brother is a brother, Joseph, who moves away and eventually moves up north. And, well, they, they, they actually both resided in Schenectady for a while. They kind of hopped around that area a little bit. Real bad drug problem involved, too. Um, kind of leaving his child, Ricky. Eric is in his son uh, with different people. One being Joe's wife, who Joe leaves. But eventually, jo Joe moves north and... Um, Richard follows. And one of the reasons is, is, at least it's surmised by everyone who's involved, who's ever been involved with this case, every investigator, is that if he hangs around Dellinson in the Middleburg, Schoharie area, everyone thinks he killed his wife. Not some people, everyone. <laughs> so even today, when you go down there, and I, I don't even know the people down there, and I go down there and start asking questions and hang up a poster, the first thing people say is he killed her. And He's a young guy. Everyone's eyes are on him. No one bothered him for the longest time. I mean, they came and asked him questions after a while, but it took a while before anyone even asked him. And then they just left. They just asked him some questions, took a statement, and left. Left him alone again. He ends up moving down to Schenectady, lives there for a while. And then this is where Lou, this is the, the, the bomb of this whole story. Yeah, so at some point, Joe decides to leave the area and he moves like Greg said up north but he moves up north to northern Vermont soon to be followed by Richard now all of a sudden our focus has shifted from New York back up to familiar territory again in the um, St. Albans area of Vermont so I started contacting some people up there to see if anyone knew them and lo and behold young Ricky had dated one of Brianna, Brianna's best friends in high school. All of a sudden, the two cases kind of collide together. So Richard Franelick's wife mysteriously goes missing in Middleburg, New York. He moves up to Vermont, and you could hit a golf ball from where he lives just about to where Brianna Maitland went missing. Okay, so what's going through your, your heads when you learn of this information? Are you just thinking this is total coincidence and, you know, the universe is dealing you some 
some sort of a you know sense of humor? Yeah, I would say that you know certainly a coincidence. Um, whether it's more than that remains to be seen. Yeah, it's that's that's a horrible set of uh, uh, luck to uh, have your wife go missing and move up to northern Vermont and have a young girl go missing. That's literally the distance of a just a township away. Yeah, and his son's ex girlfriend's best friend. Yeah, yeah, strange. So. Richard now lives in northern Vermont, and we happen to know that we have a lot of listeners in that area because of the Brianna Maitland disappearance coverage that we do, obviously, with you guys, too. So we know a lot of people from that area do check in to the show. So, well, that's pretty wild that that he's in that same area. It is. You know, I called Lou and I said, Lou, you're not going to believe this, you know, because I had been working the case down here. And I said, Richard moved to Vermont. And I told him where, and he said, he, he did a little check, and he said, you're not going to believe this. Richard's son, Ricky, dated one of Brianna's best friends. So I'm not, what, what are the chances of that? What are the chances that your wife goes missing, and you move to Vermont, and you move to an area, and then suddenly this, this young girl goes missing? I don't know. I don't know if that's a coincidence. I don't know. I can't, you know. But I don't think anyone's ever noticed that before. Well, how long has he been up in that area of northern Vermont? So I think they moved up there around 92. So Joe moves up there, his brother Joe, his brother uh, uh, and Richard moves up there, follows him, and um, take up residency there. Now, the whole thing just, you know, seems odd. I mean, I I spoke to him briefly um, and the conversation kind of went south pretty quick, but, um, you know, he he never reported her missing. Of course, his his answer to that is, well, I put her on a bus. I, I didn't know she was missing. We also never tried to have her claim deceased or anything like that. I mean, yeah, he's he's never looked for her. He'll tell you he did. He never he never looked for her. Um, and we know that the bus story is complete and utter bullshit. It's not true. It's not even close to being true. We, factually, we know that it never happened. So, did he know Brianna or any connection like that? Just well, his, his son did. His son dated her best friend, so we don't know. They, they all, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but Massaqua High School? Yeah. MSU? 